Hey everybody, it's Dr. Johnny, and I gotta tell you that this webinar I have been so excited about. I'm frequently really excited about the webinars that I do, but I have to say that I'm more excited about this one, more enthused about this one than I have been probably from any webinar that I've ever given except possibly the Great Cholesterol Myth, and I'll tell you why. Let me give you a little bit of background if you don't know. Recently, Netflix uh, put on a documentary called What the Health? Uh, for those of you who aren't in the nutrition world, I can tell you that all of us who are and who uh, spend any time whatsoever on Twitter have been doing very little other than responding to the endless questions and queries that have come in about this kind of frightening documentary. I mean, after all, it comes on, it's got some very frightening statements and facts. Uh, uh, here's one, high animal protein intake associated with increased mortality. When people eat plants, they die less. Well, that's a pretty scary fact, right? How about this one? Eating one egg per day is as bad as smoking five cigarettes per day. I mean, these are really scary things, right? How about this one? Air consumption is positively correlated with mortality from colon and rectal cancer. Nobody wants this stuff. So, of course, everybody has been asking, those of us who are not vegans or vegetarians and who are supporters of a higher fat or a higher protein diet or a more paleo diet, you know, what the hell? What's going on? What is going on with this documentary? How do you answer these questions? People are asking me and just about everybody else that I know that's on Twitter. So I thought we would do this. Now, a lot of people have looked at this documentary and said, oh, it's just vegan propaganda. Um, I want to hold off on that. I think there's a, a better way to approach this than just dismissing it. Now, we may wind up at the end of this uh, period of time we spent together on this webinar, we may wind up with that conclusion, but let's not go there yet. What I'd rather do is a little bit less of a partisan attack and more of a kind of meta-analysis. There have been some very good pieces on the internet, which I will point you to towards the end of this, that examine every single study that they uh, present in this documentary. It talks about every single fact and goes through them piece by piece. One of the, one of the articles actually goes through it frame by frame in the documentary. You know, at minute 1.31, there's this going on and here's the answer. I'm not gonna do that. Um, I would rather kind of approach this in a way that talks about how do we know what facts are. That may seem like a simple question, but by the time we get into this, you'll understand why I'm putting it there. And I want to start with a little clip from a movie called The Exorcist. If anybody hasn't seen The Exorcist, this is the scene where the old wise priest gives some advice to the young priest who is a psychiatrist and not very much a believer in things like demons and possessions, and the old priest is giving the young priest a little bit of advice about how to deal with the devil. Take a listen. Especially important is the warning to avoid conversations with a demon. We may ask what is relevant, but anything beyond that is dangerous. He's a liar. The demon is a liar. He would like to go also mix lies with the truth. He will mix lies with the truth. It is the most effective way to confuse people. If you just start talking about aliens and you start talking about crazy things, people are very easy to dismiss. You know, it's, come on. But when you start mixing some truth with some lies and presenting it in a certain way, then it's very, very confusing and extremely frustrating. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what's truth, what's lies, how do we kind of tease out facts from this whole myriad of data, and we're going to examine this statement, which seems so obvious. So many of us hear this all the time, or we say it all the time, the facts speak for themselves. You can't deny the facts. Well, I'm not so sure, and I think by the end of this webinar, you won't be so sure either. So let's talk about some of these things. So let's start with what did they get right? What did, this, what did the documentary makers actually get right in this documentary, What the Health? Well, first thing they got right is that there is a connection between diet and disease. There's no doubt there's a huge connection between diet and the incidence of almost any disease that you can mention. Huge associations between these two. Now, that's not as big an area of agreement as you might think. I mean, it's, yes, yeah, it's a big agreement, but that's like saying the Republicans and the Democrats both agree that health care is important. They have a very different perspective about uh, what to do about it. So they did get this right. There's a big connection between diet and disease. What else did they get right? Well, they got a lot of this right. 
So I want to take a minute and talk about factory farming, which I think is disgusting and hideous and offends me on every possible level from health to morals to anything you want to mention. Factory farmed, when they talk about meat and poultry and, uh, and beef and all of these, uh, uh, the animal proteins that come from these places, they got it right. They are hideous. And if this were the only source of meat and protein available to me, I too would become a vegan. However, it's not the only source. And I want to give you an example. I live in California, and a few years ago, we had a big E. coli scare. And the E. coli scare was traced to spinach. It was traced to a particular field where the spinach was coming from, and you couldn't get spinach at Subway's for a while. I mean, it was just pulled from every single source. But not one dietitian went on the air. Not one medical expert went on the air and said, see, spinach is a toxic food. Because everybody understood that a very good food had been contaminated. This is the equivalent of uncontaminated spinach. This is not. This is unhealthy not because it comes from animals, but because it comes from animals that have been shot full of steroids, antibiotics, human both growth uh, hormone, uh, bovine growth hormone, because it's been fed uh, a grain which is not the natural source of uh, dietary uh, uh, nutrients for cows which eat grass. Grain makes their stomach acid. That means they have to get even more antibiotics. It means that they are ass uh, assimilating all the pesticides and Roundup and fungicides and all the other stuff that's sprayed on the wheat. So let's be clear that all meat doesn't come from factories. Yes, about 95% of the meat in America does come from these hideous conditions, and I would advise you, as the documentary does, to stay away from them. But what they didn't tell you is that there's a source of meat that doesn't have any of those problems, and that is grass-fed beef, pastured pork, free-range poultry. It's a whole different animal, if you'll excuse the pun. Okay, so what else did they get right? Well, they got this right. There's enormous corporate influence in America on nutrition policy. Just no two ways around it. I, I'm sad to say it's not just the American Dietetic Association, which I, I, as you, most of you know, I detest. It's not just the American Medical Association, the American Diabetes Association. It's even the organizations I, be I belong to, like the American College of Nutrition. Uh, many of these have enormous sponsorships from corporate America. And yes, they influence nutrition policy mightily. At one point, the dairy industry was uh, the number one source of nutrition in, uh, information in the United States. So they got that right. What else did they get right? Not very much. So let's go through some of these things. And let's go through not so much the facts, but how they were presented. Because that is why I'm so excited about this webinar. This is really a webinar in how to think about nutrition, how to make sense of the different competing theories and the different the facts that seem to all contradict each other. And one day butter's good and one day it's bad. And they've got you know figures like one egg is the equivalent of five cigarettes and all of this. So how do you make sense of that? How do you think critically about nutrition, quote unquote, facts? That's what we're going to talk about today. And I think that's a, a really big topic because it applies not just to this documentary, but to any future documentaries and to any future articles and to the whole discussion in general about what constitutes a healthy diet. So let's talk about mistake number one. The concept that the facts speak for themselves. Now you may be looking at each other thinking, this guy's nuts, what, 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 the facts are facts. You can, of course they speak for themselves. Well, that's what facts look like. In every research study I've ever seen, that's what facts look like. Does that make sense to you? Of course it doesn't, because they have to be made into meaningful data. Someone has to look at that and decide what's important and what's not important. And why is it important and what does it mean? Someone has to impose meaning. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of this, because it's very important that you understand how it works in real life. Let's assume there was a war, and I don't want to get political in this webinar at all. I do not want to alienate half my audience, so I'm going to give you examples that you can both, both sides of the political spectrum can agree on. So let's say there's a war. I'm not even going to pick a war that, that's been politicized like Iraq or Vietnam. We're going to have a future war, and we're in the United States, and we're trying to evaluate if it was smart 
to get into this war. So we're looking at the results of the war, and we're going to try to make sense of whether it was a smart decision for the United States to be in this war or not. So we've got these facts about the war. We've got all these facts. Let's say every one of them is true. Now, I'm going to save you the time of reading all of those. Let's look at them again. If you look at these, if you just look at the red ones, it looks really bad, doesn't it? The war resulted in almost 3 million refugees, and we lost 7,000 soldiers, and tribal animosities are terrible, and the war cost $30 billion. Very bad picture, right? Now let's look at the blue ones. They're still facts, right? 100 new hospitals. Power's been restored. There's a thriving free press. There's teenage pregnancy has dropped. Girls are allowed to go to school. Sounds like a different war, doesn't it? All of these facts are true. Are you beginning to see that which ones are chosen and how they are presented is a very big part of the picture. So, again, let me warn you, not going to be political. Uh, if you Republicans think I'm, I'm hitting on you, get ready, Democrats, because I'm going to do the same thing to you. Let's say there is a health care bill. You guys pick in your own mind which one it is. Trump care or Obamacare, I don't care. Some health care bill in the distant future, I don't care. And we're going to make a documentary about that health care bill. So here's who I'm going to interview. This guy, Paul Ryan. This guy, Mitch McConnell. Hey, how about Sean Hannity? He's got some good opinions. What about... Reince Priebus. Eh, uh, definitely, let's get Ann Coulter. What kind of documentary do you think I'm going to make? And I'm going to give every single one of these people the benefit of the doubt. Not one of them is going to lie. They're going to state facts. What kind of documentary will I get? Okay, you guys think I was hitting on the Republicans? Get ready. We're going to make a documentary about the health care bill. A different documentary. Let's see. Who should I interview? Well, let's see. Let's start with Chuck Schumer. How about Nancy Pelosi? Oh, definitely Representative Lewis. And then, of course, Rachel. And let's get Bernie Sanders in there, too. What kind of a documentary am I going to make? Do the facts really speak for themselves? They don't. Here are facts about water. Look at this. Because every one of these is true. It's a leading cause of drowning. 100% of people exposed to water are going to die. Water is one of the main ingredients in herbicides. Overconsumption can cause temporary deafness. And water can be chemically synthesized by burning rocket fuel. Boy, we better stay away from that thing, shouldn't we? And how about this? Car crash statistics. You start looking at car crash statistics, you'd go nuts. You'd never get in a car in your life. Look at this stuff. And if that's all you look at, you don't drive, do you? Mistake number two. And mistake number two was best explained by probably the two most important psychologists in America um, in the history of psychology, Tversky and Danny Callahan. Um, a book was recently written, a New York Times bestseller <laughs> was recently written about their friendship and their collaboration. They have changed the way we think about thinking changed the way we think about thinking. Uh, Danny actually won the Nobel Prize in economics for his work in behavioral economics and risk assessment and, and stuff like that. And here's what they gave us, and here's what's relevant to the documentary. They gave us the concept of confirmation bias. And that's the tendency people have to seek, interpret, and remember information that confirms their preconceptions. Okay? Here's some examples. Confirmation bias, what the facts say, what confirms your belief, which ones of the facts you actually pay attention to. Look at that overlapping area in the Venn diagram, the overvalued ones, right? So the question with confirmation bias is basically, do you believe what you see or do you see what you already believe? Confirmation bias. And here's, here's, here's the beauty. Who do you think is most susceptible to confirmation bias? What group do you think is most likely to fall victim to confirmation bias and not know it? And here's the hint. It's the group that thinks they are the least likely to be influenced by confirmation bias. Doctors. They're also the group that thinks they're least likely to be influenced by marketing, and every single study shows that they're highly influenced by drug marketing. But that, that's a different tangent. So let's see who they interviewed. 
Let's see who they interviewed. Who are their experts? Well, there's Neil Brownard. He's a very nice guy. I've interviewed him myself. Great guy. He's got nice feelings about animals. He's a wonderful guy. I make statements like this. The beef industry has contributed to more American deaths than all the wars of the century, all natural disasters, and all autom uh, automobile accidents combined. By the way, you guys, if I were doing this live, I'd ask this question, so I'm going to ask it of you and just think about it for a minute. Do you think that this fact is verifiable on any level by any statistician? Because let me tell you that it's not. It's impossible to verify that. And here's another one. The typical slice of cheese is 70% fat. That's one step away from Vaseline. You getting it? These are the comments Neil makes. Then they influenced this guy. They, they interviewed Michael Greger, also very nice man, a militant vegan. Um, this is one of those guys who thinks there should be statins in the water supply and that if you eat any kind of animal protein, you're going to die a year earlier for every bite that you eat. I mean, this is who they interviewed, and he sounded very authoritative, and, and he certainly has a lot of uh, a, a passion in his beliefs. And then they interviewed Caldwell Estesin. He's This guy is a, a legend in heart disease treatment. He's, he's at the Cleveland Clinic. He's got this whole program, no oil, heart disease guru. God, I mean, how can you miss? My God, he's an acclaimed doctor. But here's who they didn't interview. This guy, who's also at the Cleveland Clinic and has quite a different view about what a healthy diet is. I would say diametrically opposed but this guy, interestingly enough, wasn't interviewed, nor were any of the other people who would agree with him. Interesting, right? Mistake number three, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Yes, what am I talking about? It's a Latin saying, and I doubt that anybody um, is very familiar with Latin. My father was a Latin major at Harvard, so I kind of grew up on this stuff. But basically, what it means is this. The rooster crowed, the sun came up, therefore the rooster made the sun crumb up. Post hoc means afterwards, ergo means therefore, and propter hoc means because of. So basically, I took a pill, I got better, therefore the pill made me better. We all do this. We confuse what we call correlation with causation. So here's everybody who went to the moon has eaten chicken, therefore chicken makes you go to the moon. And we're going to see some other examples of this later that don't seem so comic but that are very, very real. It happens all the time. It is mixing up two things that happen at the same time, and it's confusing cause and effect, as if one caused the other simply because they occurred relatively at the same time. Let's look at some other statistical correlations like that. People who died falling out of a wheelchair correlate statistically with the cost of potato chips. Seriously. The sales of sour cream correlate with the deaths from motorbike accidents. Seriously, these are real statistics, folks. The number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. Seriously. The age of Miss America correlates with murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. Seriously. You can see the correlation in the bottom left there, 0.8. It's very high correlation. That's out of a scale of 1.0 is perfect correlation. This kind of thing could get published in any journal with these kinds of statistics uh, if it were a serious correlation. Uh, the guys at 538, the statistical savants, um, Nate Silver and his team, actually did this study, and here are some of the correlations they found. Um, shellfish is correlated with right-handedness. Bananas are correlated with higher SAT scores. Coffee is correlated with cat ownership. So this is the problem of mixing correlation with causation. And they did that throughout the film. The best example I've ever seen of this, I love this example, I love talking about this example. Okay, the China study. Every time I write an article, about, and it's not just me, it's Mike Eads, it's, 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 uh, it's Chris Kresser, it's anybody who talks about paleo diets, who talks about higher protein intakes, or talks about higher fat intakes. They, we get letters from people who say, you idiot, haven't you ever heard of the China study? Haven't you ever read the China study? Okay, when, again, if we were live, I would ask the group, how many of you have heard of the China study? And probably many of you would raise your hand, and I would say, how many of you think this book you're seeing on the screen is the China study? And I'm going to venture a guess that every single one of you would raise your hand. But guess what? That's not the China study. This is the China study. That's the real China study. The book on the left 
is Colin Campbell's opinion of what the data in the real China study mean. It is his reading of the data. Would you like to see a page from the real China study? That's it. It's about 1,900 pages that look like this and about 10 pages of text. Someone has to make sense of it. Colin Campbell wrote a book from a vegan perspective in which he looked at every correlation with animal protein and he built those up and he left a lot of them out. That's what the China study looks like. Now, anybody who ever says, well, what about the China study? I said, what about, why don't you go read Denise Minger on the China study? Because Denise Minger, who is maybe the most talented writer on the internet in the field of health, and I include myself in that, she's absolutely from another planet as far as the ability to do this stuff and, and her statistical uh, sense and research chops are, are just unbelievable. Um, she went through the China study page by page, the, the, the Colin Campbell book, the book everybody thinks is the China study, looked at the correlations and then went back to the real China study. Said, isn't it interesting? He found a correlation of 54% or whatever with animal protein, but he kind of left out the one that's 67% with wheat gluten. And what about this one? And here he used uh, adjusted statistics and uh, but when they made his point, but when he, did, he didn't make his point, he used unadjusted. And, and she takes it apart in the sweet, good-natured way that she writes. She's kind of the John Stewart of, of nutrition because she doesn't offend anybody, but she just, with, with scathing wit and, 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 and frightening intelligence, analyzes this stuff and, and kind of exposes it for what it is. I urge you to look at her writings on the China study. All you have to do is put Denise Ming with the China study. Um, so, mistake number four. And this is a mistake that I have to say we are guilty of as well. I see this all the time in the pharmaceutical industry, but we do it in the natural products industry. It's kind of become the way the media reports statistics. It's kind of become the way that researchers report statistics. I'm going to explain in a minute what it means. But basically, if you want to shock people or you want to get your data published and you want to show a lot of significance, you're going to use relative statistics, not absolute, because relatives sound really impressive, and absolute, you wouldn't even blink an eyelash, and I'm going to explain why. So here's the difference, and believe me, it's not going to be difficult math. You're all going to get it. I, I have tried this out on, on our 14-year-olds. I mean, it is, it is totally not going to make your eyes glaze, glaze over. You're going to get it immediately. Okay. Relative risk. This new drug reduces heart attack risk by 50%. Well, that's darn impressive, right? But if you told what the true reduction was, and you said the new wonder drug reduced heart attacks from 2 per 100 to 1 per 100, well, that's a 50% reduction, right? That's the, a relative risk of 50%. But if you heard that, and you, get, you reduced about one heart attack, and I had to take medicine for five years to do that, it doesn't quite sound as impressive, does it? Yet that's what we use every time we say, oh, green tea increases uh, uh, life by 39%, and uh, eating this reduces uh, uh, cancer risk by 29%. We're guilty of the same thing, and every time the pharmaceutical industry says crap like this, they are doing exactly the same thing. So let's look at one of the things that What the Health says. Women who consume the most dietary cholesterol increase their risk for breast cancer by 29%. Man, that would scare me would scare me if I didn't know the difference between relative and absolute statistics. So let's look at what, we, what that 29% means. When you talk about increasing your risk, you've got to talk about increasing from what? What's your baseline risk to start with? And was it increased or decreased by the drug or by the, uh, the vitamin supplement or by the food? But you've got to start with your baseline. People see that, oh, we, the people who ate more cholesterol had 39% and they think I went from zero to 39%. That's horrific. But that's not what happens at all. So let's take some, can uh, let's look at poker. If I had a system that I could sell you that would guarantee, 100% guarantee, to triple your odds of getting a royal flush, you'd go, oh, that's good. I'd like to, I, I'll buy that. Let's look at what your odds of getting a royal flush are. Take a look at the right under odds. One in 649,739. So if I triple your odds, if I increase your odds 300%, you now have a big old chance of three 
out of 649,739. Do you get it? Let's take something like a cancer. We have a baseline risk of 1 in 100 with this particular cancer. And now we've got 39% increased risk. Well, 39% of 1 is 0.39, so your new risk is 1.39 out of 100. Now it doesn't sound quite so impressive, does it? But you're probably thinking, oh, they never do this in real life. Oh, yeah? Let's look at what they talk about with statins. And this is absolutely 100% true. This is kind of the textbook case of this, the Lipitor commercial. You probably have seen this. They finally took it down because too many of us wrote about the bullshit behind this. But okay, Lipitor reduces risk of heart attack by 30, so about one-third. It's a little more than one-third. Wow. So you're thinking, man, I got, you know, risk of heart attack is going to cut it by one-third. Man, I'm taking this statin drug, right? So let's look at exactly what this means. If you took 100 men over the course of five years, three of them would be expected to have a heart attack. These are men who are not taking medicine, and it's a, a random population. Three in 100, over the course of five years, five are getting a heart attack, okay? Accept that as a baseline. Now we're going to do a study where we're going to do a matched group match them on every possible characteristic. That's how we do studies, right? We, we find two matched groups that are the same age and the same medical history and the same risk factors and blah, 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 blah. And we're going to treat this group with Lipitor. We're going to see what happens. Here's what happened. When treated with Lipitor for five years, two in 100 had a heart attack. So it went from 3% to 2%. And that's how they got a one-third reduction. It went from 3 to 2. It was reduced 1% overall. You see that? Went from 3% to 2% with treatment. And let's remember, that is 5 years, 100 men, that's 500 man years of treatment. That means with all the risk factors, never mind the cost, all the risk factors, muscle pain, memory loss, libido loss, all of the problems, diabetes, cancer, all of the things that have been associated with drugs, they're not talking about that, but you had a 1% reduction in heart attack. How many of you would sign up for five years of Lipitor knowing those odds? Probably not a lot. But one-third, wow, man, that sounds really good, doesn't it? That's relative statistics. Mistake number five, and I talk about this, I wrote a book about it, The Great Cholesterol Myth, there's my shameless plug, I know. Many of the risk factors that they tell you increase when they say, oh, 29% more likelihood of heart attack if you eat meat. Actually, they're talking about cholesterol going up. They're not talking about actually dying. They're using cholesterol as a stand-in for heart disease, the way they've done for the past, I don't know, since 1986. And that's what our book's about, because cholesterol is a lousy stand-in for heart disease. Blood cholesterol is not a great predictor of heart disease risk. Read the book. We give you a million different studies to prove it. It's a lousy predictor of heart disease risk. Yet almost every single one of the statistics in this documentary that says that you have an increased risk of heart disease is really talking about an increased risk of high cholesterol. That is what the American Heart Association was talking about when they told everybody how dangerous coconut oil is a few weeks ago in June of 2017. All they were talking about is, yeah, it's saturated fat, it raises your cholesterol, to which we say, so what? It doesn't raise your risk of heart disease, coconut oil. It doesn't raise your risk of death. It raises your cholesterol. Who cares? And remember that every single statistic that they used in What the Health is really based on this endless fear of cholesterol, despite the fact that virtually everyone in functional medicine is abandoning this as a risk factor, certainly abandoning it as a major risk factor. Nobody's paying attention to it except the documentary writers because they know that they can scare you by using cholesterol as a stand-in for heart disease. It is not. And finally, mistake number six. Man, did they stack the deck on this one. Look at this. Remember this scene? There's Kip, the guy that made the documentary, a, a rabid vegan, by the way, and he's pointing out how unresponsive the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, he asked them, you know, why are you putting food and, and recipes on your, uh, on your website with, with known carcinogens? You know how he did that? He called the operator at the American Diabetes. He got the receptionist on the line and he starts asking her, 
Why does the American Heart Association have uh, recipes for beef when it's a known carcinogen? What kind of answer do you think you'd get with that? Seriously. It would be like me asking the guy that delivers Pepsi-Cola why they use magnesium stearate as a preservative. I mean, seriously. This is him going into the American Diabetes Association, talking to the guy behind the desk, and then using that as data that, oh, they didn't have an answer for me. Of course they didn't. You want an answer, you go to human resources, you go to the, the press, everybody knows this. You don't ask the receptionist unless you're stacking the deck because you know they're not going to be able to or legally able to answer your questions. There he is uh, calling the American Heart Association. Or I should say the operator who answers the phone at the American Heart Association. So here's the deal, guys. You got values and you have signs. And I understand the values or at least some of the values associated with veganism and vegetarianism. I share some of those values. Uh, I'm very uh, torn about eating animals, and, and, but from the animal point of view, not from the health point of view. So I understand that. In many ways, I sympathize with Neil Barnard. He, he grew up on a farm. He watched the slaughter of animals. You remember back in that first slide, that early slide with the factory farms? It is, it's horrible, 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 and traumatic. And uh, I, I understand why he feels the way he feels. But here's the problem. You can't try to make the science fit your values. Anybody remember this guy? I bet you the audience is too young to remember this guy. His name is Edward Meese. And he was the attorney general under Ronald Reagan. And during that time, it's pre-internet, of course, Reagan was uh, president from 80 to 88. They were very, very uh, seriously convinced that they, want, they wanted to wipe out pornography. And they wanted to use science to do it because their values were pornography is terrible. And I'm not, I don't want to debate whether this is true or not. I want to debate the science. So what they did is they prepared a report, the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography. The final report, July 1986, guess what it said? And, and go back, remember what I talked about when I said if we were doing a documentary on the health care bill and we interviewed just those five people from the Republican Party or we interviewed just those five people from the Democratic Party, we'd get a very different documentary, right? So what do you think this report said? It said that pornography led to crime Every single person in jail had at one time or another watched pornography. Every rapist had at one time watched pornography, just like they, those facts about water that I told you earlier. And guess what? This report said that, scientifically pre speaking, pornography led to terrible, terrible crime and should be abolished. It's only one problem. We've had 30 years of studies of this since then, and it's utter and complete BS. It's just not true. And listen. I'm not making a case for or against pornography. I'm saying that when you, when you do your quote-unquote science coming from the desire to prove a value, you don't get good science. And this thing has been debunked more times than I can count. Here's another one. Ever, anybody remember this? Anyone old enough to remember reefer madness? I wasn't around, but I certainly heard about it. Or these signs, marijuana, gateway drug to meth, and it's a vicious racket. Come on, guys, we grew up with I grew up with this. Doesn't seem to be the case, does it? But this was them making their science conform to the values. Com making your science conform to the values just doesn't work. It just doesn't. Look at these, stay here. Here's some stats on marijuana. They're pretty damn scary. They're all true. But what do they mean? What you make them mean is what counts. So looking at the whole thing, I'd have to say, yeah, it really is vegan propaganda. Very carefully chosen sources, uh, a very uh, beefed up statistics using the you know, relative versus absolute, uh, bias in who they chose. And so let's summarize basically what's wrong with this documentary. And, and again, I, I seem like I'm picking on the documentary, but this is done all the time. I, I believe this webinar, if you, if you think critically about anything that you're presented with, particularly in nutrition, which is my field, you will see this stuff a lot clearer. And that's why I think this is so important. So let's look at what they did. Number one, they assumed that the facts speak for themselves. They don't. I hope we made that very clear. They need people to speak for them. 
and the opinions of those people and the values of those people will determine which facts they report, which ones they don't, and what meaning they make those facts appear to have. Number two, this whole documentary is a case study in confirmation bias. They interviewed nothing but vegan doctors. They certainly didn't interview Professor Lauren Cordain, who kind of is the father of the paleo uh, diet. They didn't interview any of the high fat people, even the same guy that's on the Cleveland Clinic staff as, as the guy that they did interview. They confirmed all their biases. Then they made the big mistake of constantly barraging you with correlations that really do not in any manner, shape, or form equal causation. They used relative statistics. Remember that one? It's a 100% increase from one case to two. And finally, the bias and the setups, the interviewing the operator and interviewing the receptionist. So if you want more details about, you know, chapter and verse, every single fact that they reported, you know, the probably the best, most user-friendly articles by my friend Nina, uh, put, just put in What the Health Review, uh, Health Claims Backed by No Solid Evidence by Nina Teichlow. I always uh, butcher her last name, but she's really one of the smartest people writing about this stuff. And if you want something even more detailed, Rob Wolf, the author of The Paleo Solution, actually went through it frame by frame, like he tells you at minute 1.31, this is what's said here's the other side, here's the truth, and here's what was said. And so there's ways to go through this one by one, but I hope that this, this webinar, this half hour, has really kind of opened your eyes to the way people can use facts and what those facts actually mean, and that the facts really don't speak for themselves. They need spokespeople, and the spokespeople that you choose have a lot to do with the facts that are presented. So thank you very much for coming, and good night.